When I was in seventh grade, my class did a fundraiser for, I don't know, for something. I don't even really remember. All I remember is I had to sell t-shirts. <clears throat> now, being the relatively shy kid that I was, I was not about to go out door to door selling these things to strangers. That meant I was limited to family and friends. And so I took my box of t-shirts to where all of my friends were. And I set up a table in the narthex of my church. I don't remember if I sold very many, but I do remember uh, one of our family friends, somebody close to us, Pat. I remember Pat confronting me about how I should not be selling t-shirts in the church. It was something he felt really strongly about, and it was because of this story that we just read today. When Jesus said, you should not make my father's house a marketplace. Now, I was a kid, I loved and respected Pat, and I saw how upset he was, and I felt terrible. Relationships have always been really important to me. And the thought that I had done something, even unintentionally, to put my relationship with Pat in jeopardy made me feel sad and guilty. Now, in case you're thinking it, Pat's not the bad guy here. He approached me very respectfully because he felt strongly about this. And he wanted to set me straight. He wanted me to see that what I was doing was wrong. He read this story and he took it at face value. That the temple or the church is not a marketplace, and it should not be. That's not what it's for, and it's not how God wants us to use it. I always think about that when I read this story. <clears throat> I think about those stupid t-shirts and how afraid I was that I might have damaged this relationship with my friend. But each time I read this story, I also have to respectfully disagree with Pat's interpretation of this text. This is a complicated story to unpack, partly because of the way St. John tells it. <clears throat> it's different from the way any of the other gospel writers tell it. St. Mark quotes Jesus saying, You have made my father's house a den of thieves, implying that there's something shady happening here, some unfair business practices. And St. Matthew and St. Luke follow suit. But in John's story, Jesus says, Marketplace, not den of thieves. According to John, there doesn't seem to be anything immoral or crass going on here, just honest business. You see, just before the Passover, people would come and offer sacrifices at the temple. Originally, when the temple system was set up, most folks had livestock of some kind of their own because uh, Israel was an agrarian society. Everyone had easy access to a cow or a goat or a dove, either from their own herds or flocks or by trading with a neighbor. But by Jesus' time, the folks in Judean cities had, were about as likely to have livestock as you or I. So in order to make a sacrifice, you had to buy one. <clears throat> and since the second commandment, which we read today, forbids the use of graven images, and the Roman coins with, were uh, graven, as it were, with the image of Caesar, they could not be used in the temple. They had to be changed for non-graven coins. And that's what the money changers did. All of this infrastructure was set up to facilitate the regular, legal, institutional worship of God in the temple as commanded by Torah. There's nothing wrong going on here. And that is what makes Jesus' action today so memorable. He's not cleansing the temple, he's destroying it, at least symbolically. He's making it so that people are unable to fulfill their biblically mandated obligations for worship. The building may be intact, but he's completely disrupted the infrastructure. Not because anybody was doing anything wrong, but because the system itself, the temple ordinances and practices, as outlined in Torah, was wrong. Well, okay, wrong is maybe too strong a word, but let's unpack that. <clears throat> the laws given by God to Moses, who gave them to the Hebrew people in the wilderness, those laws were intended as a gift, as a fresh start. It was a set of rules for life together, life as God's people rather than Egyptian slaves, which was the only life they'd ever known. Those laws were intended to help people know God and who God was by showing them how God intended for them to live in community. Unfortunately, it's always a lot easier to judge whether or not a rule has been broken than it is to meditate on it and figure out what that rule teaches us about God. And so we end up placing a lot of weight on rules 
rather than on the God who gives them. <clears throat> and I think that that is what Jesus sees here. He sees how the concept of worship seems to have morphed into this transactional system of sacrifice. And that makes him upset. So upset that instead of lodging an official complaint or going out and teaching an alternative, he just grabs a whip and starts flipping tables. And when the folks in charge ask for a sign, some argument to justify his action or proof that he has the authority to do this, he points to himself. He was speaking of the temple of his body. Jesus is himself the sign. I wonder if what made Jesus so angry, angry enough to break things, was that he was so saddened that this was the only experience of God that people had at that temple. An experience that felt sad and guilty that feeling of a person who's ruined a relationship, intentionally or not, by breaking the rules. Our relationship with God had become transactional. We do this, God does that in return. I can't help but think that in symbolically destroying the temple, Jesus was trying to destroy our misconception of a legalistic God who only cares whether or not we keep the rules. Instead of this transactional God, Jesus presents us with an alternative, a relational God, a living person with whom we can converse and reason and argue, a person to be embraced and loved or rejected, even killed. He invites us to deal with God relationally, not transactionally. And he is himself the sign that God wants to deal with us the same way. God doesn't just love us or bless us when we perform the proper ritual actions or fulfill the requirements. God doesn't love us in order to get us to do those things. God does that whenever God feels like it, because that is who God is. This is God's covenant that God desires to convey in the law. That God's love for us precedes anything that we might do or say or believe about God. And that we are always invited into this relationship. That we are not independent of it. The covenant is that God always loves first. And constantly invites us into that love. The law is not a list of rules to follow, but a description of what that love looks like in action for people who have never experienced it firsthand. Not really. To reduce that love to a set of rules, or to a collection of religious doctrines for that matter, it seems to me to miss the point entirely. It seems only to continue on in that same transactional view of a God who refuses to offer love or blessing unless the terms are first met. This isn't a story about whether Christianity is superior to Judaism, or whether or not sacrifice is necessary, or which rules we need to follow. I can only read this story as a story of Jesus desperately trying to point out a reality that is too fantastic, too sweeping, too profound for us ever to reason out on our own. God doesn't look like we think God looks like. God isn't just a product of our imaginations. God is something bigger. If this is true, if God doesn't simply judge us as good or bad based on how well we happen to live up to God's expectations, then I find myself wondering, what does that say about how we might judge one another? If God deals with us relationally and wants us to deal with God relationally rather than transactionally, how might God hope for us to deal with one another? It's so easy to see others as good or bad, as right or wrong, depending on how they meet the expectations that we have of them. In other words, to deal with them transactionally. But Jesus invites us to consider another way, to live relationally rather than transactionally, to recognize that people, both ourselves and our neighbors, are more 
than our best or our worst actions. Or as Luther would say, that we are all simultaneously sinners and saints. When Pat confronted me that day, I felt really hurt. But that's not the end of that story. Pat and I continued in that relationship because, and because of that, there are a lot more things that I think of first when I think of Pat. I think of how he gave me a job in high school, all the dirty jokes he loves to tell and loves to hear me tell. I think of all the meals and the beers and the shory, stories we've shared, all the discussions and the arguments we've had. I remember how he helped me make an urn for my dad's ashes after he died and for the love and the support that he gave to my family in that time. That's why, even though I disagree with him, kind of vehemently about some things, I will always love and respect him. That's what relationship is. It's too complex to be boiled down to a handful of good or bad things. It's this big, messy, beautiful thing that just keeps growing. And that, I think, is what Jesus is trying to teach us about God and God's covenant in that moment in the temple. The covenant isn't a contract with rules and consequences. It's a promise of a living, organic relationship founded for all time on the deep and abiding love that is at the core of who God is. And because of that foundation, it can never be broken, not really. Because that love is strong enough to withstand rejection and exile, strong enough to rebuild temples, strong enough even to come back from the dead.